Do you feel that? Was it settling or unsettling for you to sit in total silence for 45 seconds? I know for a few of you that was settling, but for most of us it's not. It's incredibly unsettling to be suddenly left with a void of no noise. And that's what I want to share with you today, friends. I am troubled. I am troubled by our collective discomfort with silence. It is antithetical to our cultural rhythm. It is antithetical to our way of being. It is antithetical to the way that we are wired and shaped and formed to perform, to sit in silence. For most of us who have been groomed by Western society, well, it feels like a terrifying proposition, doesn't it? Yes. And yet if we could somehow tame the monstrous amount of noise that we are subject to today, I believe we would. I believe we try. Consider this. Have you ever met someone so unaffected by the chaos and the cacophony and the noise of our Western and postmodern world. Have you ever met a person like that who is totally and completely a non anxious presence in an anxious world? And deep down, you want to be that person. We're not doing silence now, you can talk. Deep down, you want to be that person. Yes, you do. Because who wants to be tossed to and fro by the winds of cultural change every time they blow? You want to be that person. You want to be a non-anxious presence in a highly anxious world. You do, but but there's a problem, yes? We, We want to be that person not swayed by the chaos, not overcome by the noise, but we are hindered externally by the cacophony of sounds and information as well as the pace of our Western world. For instance, did you know that today you have access to more information in 30 minutes than your grandparents had in 30 years? And we're absorbing and absorbing and absorbing and absorbing and absorbing and running and absorbing and running and absorbing until our entire life is one frenetic pace with a cluttered mind. That's the issue. The amount of information, the amount of sheer noise robs us all of the gifts that come with just a bit of quiet. In fact, I imagine that this onslaught of noise and information and opportunities and frenetic pace makes you feel trapped in this cooperatively constructed prison that we call modern life, a prison that you may feel from which there is no escape. And and to me, this is just wrong. And it's wrong for so many reasons. It's wrong for so many reasons. But the primary reason it's wrong, listen to me, is because it is robbing you of the abundant life that Jesus promised. It's robbing you. Now, most of us have never been robbed. But let me tell you what it feels like in real life. To feel scared, violated overwhelmed and taken advantage of. That is what life is doing to all of us every day. And that's how it feels. And believe me, I understand for more years than I can count these three words dictated the whole of my life. I have to. You hear what I'm saying today? I have to. I have to take that meeting. Otherwise, they might leave the church. That's right, Pastor. I, I, I have to finish this, otherwise we might not make budget. I have to accept this speaking invitation, otherwise we're not going to make ends meet this month. Those are just a few examples of years worth of have-tos. 
that I lived in. And you know where that led me? Total burnout. Total burnout. In fact, in the spring of 2015, after years of have-tos, traveling two to three times per month, every month, years of late and early meetings, and 80-hour-plus weeks, I finally hit a wall. My weight ballooned up to over 300 pounds, the heaviest I've been since I played in the NFL. Except it wasn't a healthy 300. It was a Popeye's 300. There's a difference. <laughs> There's a difference. NFL 300 and Popeye's 300 ain't the same 300. And I was tired all the time. In fact, the other day, we looked back at some old pictures, and I look older eight years ago than I do right now. Because I was killing myself. And at the not-so-subtle urging of Brianna and a few of our then-elders, I decided to take a month away. Now listen. <laughs> a month away sounds a lot harder than you might think it does. You see, for the first ten days, I was miserable. And I, and I didn't understand it at the time, but, but listen to me. My body was so overproducing adrenaline to keep up with the pace that I was living that when I finally slowed down, it was like I was coming down off of drugs. I was crashing. I was crashing. I was irritable. I was unpredictable. I was not pleasant to be around. I was constantly complaining about being bored. Am I talking to anybody today? I'm being honest, so you can be honest. You don't think you struggle with boredom? Leave your phone for half a day. Mm. Leave it for an hour. Leave it for an hour. Leave the house and leave it. And then show me what you're talking about. Even my driving was so aggressive that the locals were pulling off the road to let me go by. And they so sweet in Hawaii, to, you know, they're like, chill, brother, you go on by. And that was our first 10 days. Sometime around day 11, something snapped. A release of some kind happened. All of a sudden, everything in me calmed down. I relaxed. I breathed deeper. The air smelled sweeter. My patience lengthened. My driving slowed. In fact, my driving slowed so much that at one point, Brandon was like, hey, if you don't pick it up, we're not going to make it there on time, which is a rare occasion indeed. And I was like, it's all right. Whenever we get there, we get there. <laughs> Listen to me, guys. All jokes aside, it was the most peace I've ever had in my life. We were standing in a place far off the beaten path, so we didn't have access to many distractions or amusements. We had to enjoy things such as keeping company with each other. Conversation. Spontaneous laughter. We had to enjoy things such as inviting my children to ask me deep questions about myself so that they would know me as a human being and not just as dad. Everything in that time changed for me. And the idea of boredom, it faded. The need to produce faded. The adrenaline that fueled my frantic pace faded. Listen, I became whole again. And I needed, don't miss this, I needed to withdraw to do so. Now I share this with you, not from a place of judgment, but from a place of invitation. I know, I know that several of you felt every word of this story because you are living it right now. And I know that to be true. I know it to be true. You are grinding, you are building, you are pushing, you are working. You are surrounded by the clamor and sound of Western reality. You are running at the pace of this very Western, very American world and you are tired. Stress, overwhelmed, and you want to withdraw, but the have-tos say that's impossible. That's, that's just not possible. Now, though I believe this is a minute-layer challenge, here's what I, I do believe, and if you want to follow along, of course, hit that QR code, and the notes will be there in the Bible app event for you, but, but here's what I believe is the primary issue 
We, we do not withdraw because we feel that if we do, things will fall apart. Can we be honest about that today? Things are going to fall. If I pull out, things are going to fall apart. If I withdraw, things are going to fall apart. If I stop producing, if I stop moving, if I stop making, then everything will come undone. So we have to. You know, secondarily, and something to consider, we also don't withdraw because we fear boredom. Can you sit at a stoplight without looking at your phone? Can you stand in a line without scrolling through your text messages or social media? Can you just stand there? Maybe strike up a conversation with a stranger? Be in the pharmacy for six hours waiting for your prescription? <laughs> with nothing to do? Is it just Kaiser? I thought, I thought it was everybody. They're like, Mr. Crump, we'll be right with you. One beard later. Can you be in that environment without being bored? Can you actually do it? I would wager not for most of us because we have a hurried, distracted, adrenaline-fueled life hooked on Americana and digital death traps, and we cannot get out. And here's the issue. It's robbing us of being fully present to God, to other people, present to all the good and beautiful things in this world. Listen, present to our own souls. In fact, Ronald Rollheiser said we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. <laughs> Let it sit for a minute. And I would add to this sentiment that we are allowing the have-tos to tear us away from the get-tos and the need-tos. And what we need more than anything, trying to navigate the pace and the pressure of our host culture is a regular rhythm, listen, of withdrawal with God. That is our greatest need too. And as we'll see, even in Jesus' life and ministry, watch this, withdrawal with God is essential to a healthy and whole soul. Withdrawal with God reminds us that not all will fall apart if we stop. Withdrawal with God reminds us that we can be fully present with him and others. Listen, withdrawal with God heals our souls and quiets our anxieties. So today, I'm asking you, come on, all eyes on me, Tupac. Deep breath in. Now take down the veneer of strength and power that you've learned to walk in. And let's receive what the Lord actually wants for us in an abundant life. At the end of Matthew chapter 3, if you're following along, the former tax collector's gospel, we are invited to witness a glorious scene. Jesus is baptized, and when he comes out of the water, the voice of God thunders, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, though this is a bit tangential, hear this. When we know that God is pleased with us for who we are and not for what we produce, then withdrawing with him will be a delight and not a chore. So, so. Digest that thing. You see, God is not about you because of what you can do. <laughs> he don't need you. But he wants you. He wants you. He didn't need you to produce. But he wants you to enjoy his presence. Now back to the story. The father renounces his affirmation of his son, and then immediately, immediately, we read that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the desert. Okay. Now, scholars will tell you that the desert in that passage does not necessarily mean sand and heat and scorching temperatures. In fact, the word there in the Greek language, eremos, 
Eremos, or Eremos, if you're from the east side. Eremalba, hey, I got to get out of there, Eremal. Has many meanings, including desert, deserted place, desolate place, lonely place, solitary place. Watch this. Quiet place. That's the range of meaning of the word. And so Jesus, upon being baptized, listen to this, upon being baptized, immediately withdraws to a quiet place. Which is not exactly a solid start to a great ministry. So after you got ordained, what'd you do? I left. (laughs) Where'd you go? To a quiet place. Who went with you? Nobody. How's the ministry doing? Great. (laughs) In our minds, that would not seem like a great start to a great ministry. But if you study the gospel records of his life and ministry, listen, you will find that this was a common and seemingly necessary practice in the life of Jesus. Over and over again, we find him retreating to the Eremos, which brings us to our passage for today. Now, Mark's gospel record compared to the others is fast, patient, action packed. Okay? Mark is your Twitter friend. 140 characters, that's all he needs. And it covers about three weeks of Jesus' ministry, and listen, only about 20 minutes of Jesus talking. And his first chapter is essentially one long report on Jesus' first day on the job to rescue the world. Jesus' first day was a long, long day. He got up early that morning, the Bible tells us that. He called his first disciples. So he got up early that morning. He said, hey, I want you, 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 and you. Eh, yeah, you can come too. And, and he called his first disciples. And then he went to the synagogue to teach. He cast a demon out of a guy who started yelling at him while he was preaching. Now, we did a whole series on that back in January. Okay, you need to go back and listen to it if you want to get back acquainted with the things of the Bible and not the things of secular postmodernity and intellectualism. Okay? And you can be intellectual without intellectualizing things that do not require such things. So he cast a demon out of a guy. So if you start yelling at me while I'm preaching, I'm going to be like, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> be gone. Baruch Hasha Tanoi. Right? He cast a demon out of a guy, and then he healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law while they were over at her house for lunch. It was a busy day. You want something to eat, baby? Oh, by the way, I got this thing. Will you just, will you just do what you do? And just, thank you, sweetheart. You want some more tea? Like, that's, that's how I imagined it. Right? He healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law over lunch. And then Mark tells us in the morning, after all of that, after that long day, In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and he went out to, what's that word? Eremos. And there, he prayed. And there, he prayed. After a full day of working hard, you can read this for yourself, as the evening piled up, And they brought more and more people to him. More sick people needed to be healed. More possessed people needed to be delivered. More good news needed to be preached. Jesus did it all to fulfill his calling. One would think that after such a full and long day, Jesus would have slept in. I had a long day yesterday. I'm going to sleep in tomorrow. One would think he would have scheduled himself. Some time to cycle through his two alarms. Any five alarm people in here? Be honest. The Lord will heal you. There you go. God is here. He, there's healing in the house today. In America, one would think he would have gotten up and went right back to work the next day. Because why? There's always more to do. There's always more to do. But instead, what do we find Jesus doing? Instead, Jesus does something remarkable. It says he gets up early before the sun rises. 
which presumes he took his self to bed at a reasonable hour. Self. Yeah, look, I've become responsible in this pulpit. Isaiah 43, (laughs) until you perceive it. Listen, it presumes he went to bed at a reasonable hour. Now, I'm not coming for nobody in particular. But if you consider yourself a night owl, you are deceiving yourself. You see, science calls it circadian rhythms. The Bible calls it healthy rhythms. My mama called it, take you to bed. (laughs) I'm so tired. I don't know why I'm so tired. What time you go to bed? I go to bed at 12, get up at 6. Hmm. Well, could it be that's why you're tired? Because you're essentially functioning like a partially drunk person 24 hours a day because that is what sleep deprivation does to us. Did you know that? It's like being inebriated. And there's no such thing as weekend catch-up sleep either. None of this has nothing to do with the rest of what I'm saying today. But I just need you to know this. I'm going to catch up on the weekend. No, you're not. You're going to stay up and watch that movie you've been meaning to watch all month. I know it hurts, but it's okay. I told you there's healing in the house today. Sometimes you got to cut things out with a scalpel before Jesus can come suture it up. He eases out of the house before anybody can even count him missing. And he heads to the Eremos. Now, let's take a moment to consider this in the broader context. Jesus, according to Mark's gospel, is baptized, right? And then he leaves for 40 days to the Eremos. He returns for one day of incredible productivity and then immediately leaves again to go pray. Now think about that for, could you imagine starting a new job, your dream job, the job you know you don't have the education to have, but it's a salary you always wanted. And you show up for one day and you kill it. Everybody catching hands. It's a beautiful day. And then the next day you leave. You take your first vacation day. Think about that. Think about it. We read this stuff and we forget to put context on it. That is what, it would be like me showing up on opening day for Renovation Church, preaching, and then be like, all right, man, I'll see y'all in about a week or so. Where you going? I got to go pray. But we got stuff to do. I know. But I found that the more I have to do, the more I need to. Mark tells us that Jesus' friends woke up immediately and they went looking for him, okay? Which implies that this was an intrusion to what Jesus was doing. It's just like, you know, some of us who have kids. They manage to find us no matter where we go. And they're always looking. Now, when we're looking for them, they can't be found. (laughs) But they always... (laughs) Set me free, Lord. Everyone is looking for you, his friends told him when they found him. Everybody is looking for you. Apparently, the expectations were there were going to be more miracles happening today. There's more for you to do, Jesus. What do you mean? You're... Look at all these sick people that need healing. What do you, what do you, how could you just leave like that? But Jesus... He followed the rhythm of life that he knew would serve his rhythm of life. And he came out of the Eremos with incredible clarity. You see, they came to him and they said, everybody is looking for you and they want more miracles. But at that time, it was not time for more miracles. I don't have time to preach that message right now. What he said is, no, I actually need to go preach. And it says that they left from that moment and they went to the next place. He knew precisely what he had to do the next day. Watch this, because he had spent time away from doing. 
In fact, I read this interesting article, and it turns out that the top CEOs in America schedule up to one hour in their day every day called thinking time. Do you know that? Thinking time. Because even in our secularized society, the highest performing people understand that you've got to pull back to evaluate what it is you're doing. And if you're always doing, then there is no being. Now, imagine how meaningful for any of us, especially those of us who are followers of the way of Jesus, that hour would be if it was not spent just thinking but also communing with the Father. It would be a game changer for our reality. You see, Jesus immediately establishes his rhythm of life, productivity in my calling, withdrawing with my, withdrawal with my father, and a return to productivity in my calling. Can I give it to you again? Maybe you'll write it down. Productivity in my calling, and then a withdrawal with my father, and then a return to productivity in my calling. Not productivity, 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 productivity. I hate my job. Productivity, 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 productivity. They better not try me today. Productivity, productivity, productivity. Vacation, 50% battery recharge. Productivity, productivity, productivity. Burnout. It's a different rhythm. And here's the reality. If you want the abundant life Jesus offers, then you must adopt the life Jesus lived. The quiet place was a priority for Jesus. But he didn't want this just for himself. He wanted it for his friends too. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, we read a story where the disciples are now fully active in their own ministry. They're fully active in their own ministry. And it says that they were tired. In fact, Mark tells us that so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat. Any forget to eat people in here? See, nobody want to raise their hand now. They're like, he's coming for all of us. Thank you. I, re- I respect that. I had so much to do today, I forgot to eat. How many days you going to go like that? <laughs> if you have so much to do that you're forgetting to eat, you have too much to do. So many people were coming and going that they didn't have a chance to eat. And Jesus' response to them is firm and tender. What did he say? Come with me by yourselves to what? The eremos, the quiet place, and get some rest. Jesus understands what the human soul needs. That true rest is only found in withdrawal with the Father. In fact, if you read Dr. Luke's gospel, and I hope you would at some point for your own benefit, you'll see that Jesus went to his quiet place no less than nine times. In fact, it says Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. It's that same word, eremos. When we get busy, we need to withdraw more, not less. When people demand a great deal from us, or God forbid you have the chance to become famous and in demand, we need to withdraw more, not less. When life feels like an endless list of boxes to be checked off, we don't need to power through. We need to withdraw to our power source. That's the invitation before us today. The last thing I'll say, and and, and I don't mean this to be too confrontational, but have any of you walked on water? I mean, seriously, I want to know. Anybody? anybody, You are? No? No takers? You ever fed 20,000 people from a can of sardines and a box of Jiffy cornbread mix? Have you ever done that? No, neither have I. And so it would stand the reason. Listen, oh, I wish I could come down there and just get up in your face right now. <laughs> look, I'm toes is all. Look, I just. It would stand to reason, because you're reasonable people, you're smart people. It would stand to reason that if 
Jesus needed to get away. Maybe, maybe, maybe you do too. I mean, again, I, 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 two proof points out. You, you ain't walking on water. You're not feeding thousands from very little. You can't say of yourself, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If he needed to get away to rest, would it stand to reason that you need a little Ray Moss in your life? Now, if you're investigating a relationship with Jesus today or you're deconstructing or in some season where you're questioning what it is that you believe, listen, I know the thrust of this message, even apart from all the Jesus stuff, it still grabs you. How do I know that? I know that because it would be best for you just as a human being to have time for your soul to catch up with your body. I know that you need space to take inventory on how you're doing and where you are emotionally and mentally. And I know if we can be honest for just a moment that there is something inviting here about this rhythm of life that is different than what we are living. A means of being fully present even if just to yourself. But here is the good news. The good news is that the invitation goes beyond that. The invitation is not just an invitation to more solitude and more presence in self where you can recenter and recalibrate. It is an invitation from your creator to be with your creator so that you might more fully know what it means to be human under the hand of the one who made you. That's the invitation. And I would propose to you, whether you're here in the room or whether you're joining us online, that between headlines and long days and short nights and packed weekends, hopefully this is music to your soul. And that this invitation to rest would not be taken lightly. Now, This practice of Jesus that we examine today has come to be called the spiritual rhythm. You want to write this down, of silence and solitude. Silence and solitude. Two words that by their very nature are antithetical to our host culture, yes? (laughs) Now, solitude is relatively straightforward. It's when you are alone with God and your inner world, okay? Note, and your inner world. And some of us are avoiding our inner world like the plague, It is when you're alone with God and your inner world. And note, solitude is not isolation. INTJs, raise your hand, be honest. Because you're like, you're preaching my message, Pastor. All I want to do is be alone. Yeah, that's called isolation. It's not the same. Okay? Isolation is uh, uh, aloneness without purpose. We're talking about restorative Aloneness. Isolation is escape. Solitude is embrace. Isolation is running from. Solitude is running to. Isolation is life taking. Solitude is life giving. There's a difference. And along with solitude, we invite silence. That's why we did that moment together at the beginning. To let us feel that rumble when there is no background noise to attune to. And it's an invitation to quiet both external and internal noise. In fact, the great African theologian Augustine wrote, entering silence is entering joy. You see, we live in a noisy, loud world. And we must learn to live in rhythms without noise. External noise is easy to eliminate. Turn off your phone, turn off your TV, turn off the radio, turn it off. Buy paper water bottles. (laughs) External noise is easy to eliminate. Internal noise, on the other hand, that's a whole other animal. And learning, listen, and and this is as far as I can go in a 30-minute sermon. Learning to declutter your mind of internal noise only begins to happen when you quiet all the external noise. You have to quiet the external, withdraw to the eremos, explore your inner world, and then begin to declutter and quiet it before the Lord. So what do we do? 
A couple of things to consider. Acknowledge that practicing silence and solitude, especially when we are busy, is essential to a healthy spiritual life. Admit that we are busier, that the busier we are, rather, the more we need to withdraw with God. Not less. I'm going to invite you to pray today, to feel the desire to spend uninterrupted quiet time with God, no matter how busy you are. And then I'm going to challenge you, incorporate a practice of intentional withdrawal into your weekly routine. Now, I suggest this rhythm to everyone, but especially for those of you, any, any business owners, small business owners, CEOs, company people, go lift them up. So this is especially for you. Especially, I, I suggest it for everybody. But it's especially for you. Why? Because you don't have your own well-being on your mind alone, but also the well-being of the people that you're leading. Okay? Here's the rhythm I suggest. An hour a day of silence and solitude. An hour a day. It can be early in the morning before the sun comes up. We can join David and Jesus in that, which means you've got to go to bed. Right? Or it can be in the middle of the day, however you want to do it. It's an hour a day of silence and solitude. An hour a day. Okay? A day per month of silence and solitude. Oh, now it's getting sticky. A day per, yes, 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 yes. A day per month. And there's a couple places you can go. There's a great monastery in, um, in Conyers, a Catholic monastery. It's a great place to go. There's a great place called Ignatius House up in the Northeast. These are great places where they will take you through guided silent retreats. And it is good for your soul. Two days per quarter. So every three months, you need to take two days to the Air Moss, especially if you're running a business or if you're responsible for other people. Two days per quarter. Now, I think we, yeah, we're missing one, but I'll tell you. It's not in here, but I'll tell you. One week per year. Now, that sounds crazy, right? And I'm not talking about vacation. I'm talking about a week for purposeful spiritual devotion and growth. And you need a vacation. You need some fun time and some restorative time. And if you have a manager or a boss who don't get that, find one who does. Y'all got the power right now. You know that. Like, employees have the power. Quiet quitting? Like, oh, I can't get my two weeks? You want me to quiet quit up in here? Huh? That's what you want? Is that what you want? You want some quiet quitting? Now, either I can get my week with the R.A. Moss and my week in Cancun, or I'm finna quiet quit like a mug. That's how y'all need to go in Monday morning. Go in Monday morning and be like, I'm trying to get my air mouse. What? My air mouse. So I don't kill everybody up in here. You would rather me praying than snapping. One week per year. Now, if that feels intimidating, if that feels intimidating, and I know it can, then consider taking just one of these things and applying it to your week this week. Now, again, hear me. All of them are going to heal your soul. But if you would just apply one of them this week, just one of them this week, it'll be a game changer for your life. You see, silence and solitude have long been seen as the most important spiritual practices that we can have. And that makes sense. Why? Because your relationship with God is no different than any other. It takes time alone together to build actual depth and intimacy. How you think you would be doing with your spouse or with your friends if you never spent any intimate time alone together to build some depth? Well, God, don't talk to me. You ain't listening. You got to quiet the noise to hear his voice. Nothing wrong with signs and wonders, but let's attune ourselves to the small, still voice. When we take... Away from this today then is what? That withdrawal will save our souls. If you want to write that down, write it down. It's in the Bible now. Withdrawal will save our souls. And not only that, it will make us more present people, present to God, present to others, present to all that is good and beautiful in the world, present to our souls. And the reality is, 
The reality is that if we do not withdraw, we will never truly catch our breath. And we will never be fully spiritual people. In fact, Omri Nowen says, oh, there it is. Why? Okay. Omri Nowen says, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. Now, you came in here today, I imagine, feeling the weight of the noise and the pace and the chaos of our host culture. You came in feeling a bit trapped, as I have felt so many times over the years. But here's the good news. If we follow Jesus into his life-giving way, into his rhythms of withdrawal, then we will become that person. That person that is unaffected by the chaos. That person that is unaffected by the noise. That person that is somehow centered in the middle of a jungle. We will become that person, this is how I like to say it, who is a non-anxious person in a highly anxious world. You will become that person. But you know there's a greater call than that? Than you just becoming that person? If you follow the way that Jesus has shown us, you will show others what true life looks like. And so that's my invitation to you today, Renovation. Let's awaken this world to the way of Jesus and the abundant life that he promises. And that starts with us living into the rhythms that he has put in front of us for a whole soul and an abundant life. Father, we pray now in the name of Jesus that you would move in power through your word, and those who have heard would be truly transformed. Father God, I pray that this word would sink deep into our hearts, that we would long for the Eremos, that we would prioritize time alone with you to become the people that we want to become in this highly anxious world. But more than that, to become more intimate with the presence of our Father. We ask all of these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.